David, you'll want to unmute now. Uh, I got remuted. I had unmuted. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> I'll try that again. My name is David Hirsch. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the board past president. Thank you for joining our online service. All UUC services and activities will be virtual this month due to the current COVID-19 surge. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a religious community who commit ourselves to diversity. We hope to nourish human differences, those of gender, race, age, ability, sexual orientation, political views, culture, class, and religious belief. Welcome to all who treasure freedom of conscience in the search for truth. We promise to do our best to provide you a spiritual home. We extend a special welcome to our visitors today. We hope you follow our Facebook page to participate in Zoom and receive announcements about special events and our religious exploration classes. Please sign up for our weekly email. There should be a link in the comments section on our Facebook page where you can sign up. We're so glad you've joined us online for services. For the month of January, we'll be only doing virtual services and events. We're so glad you joined us today. Hi, I'm Patty Cleary. Uh, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, and I was asked to speak a little bit about why I give uh, to um, the congregation during this time of pledging. Uh, and I've been thinking about this a lot about um, what it means to give um, and to be a part of community. So for me, the UUC is such an important place for community and fellowship. That that is the main reason why I make a commitment to be present for a lot of services uh, and, and to give of myself. And so giving can be any number of things. Giving is giving your presence. It can be giving your work and your labor to make sure that the, that the congregation is, um, meeting its needs. It can be giving your art um, and your talents, and it can be giving resources. And I, as I've been thinking about how I give and why I give, uh, it has, I, I realized that the UUC is one of the few places that I can go to, to be a part of community that isn't 
that isn't commerce related. So, and I feel like this has been in stark contrast during the pandemic when uh, before the pandemic, I used to be like, I just want to be around people. So what am I going to do? I could go out to dinner. I could go shopping. I could go, um, go to the movies, you know, just to feel like I'm, I'm a part of something else. And, and all of that has been questioned in terms of like, what do I really want to go out and do those things? Um, and yet being a part of the church community was never um, a question of uh, of whether or not I could do that. Like we've always provided this community online um, and it was wonderful to go back into those spaces. Um, and it's not a transactional experience. It is that when you go, you, you give the gift of your presence to the community and the community gives that back to you. Um, and that's something that I feel like I have, I value so much to be in a part of a space that values and gives dignity to everyone who's there, um, that we show up for each other, no matter what our identities are, what our jobs are, what uh, the size of our pocketbooks, um, our, our citizen status. Um, there's so much, so many ways in which we show up for each other that is treating each and every one of us with dignity and respect. And I wanna support that community as best I can in all of the ways that I can. And so um, the, the UUC is a big part of my life and there are some very cherished relationships that I have with individuals in the UUC and as the community as a whole. And so that's why I give, thank you. Good morning, I'm Debbie Campbell. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm your worship associate this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'll be doing opening words from Reverend Kat Cox. Did you know that Community Ministry Sunday is an official date on our Unitarian Universalist Associ Association calendar for the first Sunday in February of each year? It can be celebrated any, any Sunday, of course, and in other ways. This year, we're doing January 23rd. The date was chosen to honor the four chaplains, also sometimes referred to as the immortal chaplains, who were four United States Army chaplains who gave their lives to save other civilian and military personnel during the sinking of the troop ship Dorchester on February 3rd, 1943, during World War II. They helped other soldiers board lifeboats and gave up their own life jackets when the supply ran out. The chaplains joined arms, said prayers, and sang hymns as they went down with the ship. The four men were relatively new chaplains who all held the rank of first lieutenant. They included Methodist minister, the Reverend George L. Fox, Reform Rabbi Alexander D. Good, PhD, Roman Catholic priest, the Reverend John P. Washington, and Reform Church in America minister, the Reverend Clark V. Poling. The four chaplains are emblematic of the reality lifted up by the previous UUA president, Peter Morales in congregations and beyond that so much of the work for and witnessing to the values of our faith is done out in the world, often in interfaith contexts, both by ordained clergy and by committed lay leaders serving in a variety of capacities. Community ministries of both pastoral and prophetic kinds make real in the larger world, the commitment of all Unitarian Universalists to the shared mission of this faith. To do, we can, to do all we can to contribute to the creation of the tipping point, whereby the values we affirm in our UUA seven principles may lead us to a just, healed, and transformed world. Lifting up the work we do in celebratory ways is renewing, energizing, and inspiring. We need to spread the good word that community ministry is for everyone who takes serious the calling of our faith to engage more broadly and creative, creatively in building the world we want to live in. Today, we look forward to hearing from three members who share the work and care from their hearts. And now Ashley Lynn will light the chalice for us. Hi, I welcome you at home to light your candle. In the mystery of life about us, there is light. 
it gives us a place to grow, to be, to rejoice together. It opens the pathways to love. In this place of friendship, there is freedom. Let us light, no, yeah, let the light we kindle go before us, strong in hope, wide in goodwill, inviting the day to come. Wherever darkness is to be put to flight, let there be light. Hi, I'm the Reverend Julianne Lapp. It's so good to be with you this morning on Community Ministry Sunday. And, you know, I am a ordained clergy and this, this message is so important to me because we believe in Unitarian Universalism that you don't have to have a reverend or a doctor or anything by your name to make a difference. We can all make a difference. And I'm gonna share with you a story um, this is called the four chaplains and um, this is so important um, and I hope you'll cozy up and listen to this story. It was dark and cold in the early hours of February 1943. An elderly coastal liner, the Dorchester, had been pressed into service as an army troop ship. She was making her way slowly through the frigid waters of the North Atlantic towards Greenland. She was carrying 904 men, many of whom were new recruits. Because there was a sub, there were in submarine infested waters, the captain had directed the men to keep life jackets on them at all times. <clears throat> During the difficult and uncomfortable passage, the four army chaplains on board worked tirelessly to maintain everyone's morale. Chaplain George Fox was Methodist. Chaplain Alexander Good was a Jewish rabbi. Chaplain Charlie Poland was a Dutch reformed and Chaplain John Washington was a Catholic priest. At 12.55 a.m. on February 3rd, the Dorchester was caught in the crosshairs of a U-456. One torpedo was launched and slammed into the Dorchester amidships. The wound was mortal. The ship began taking on water and listening, listening to starboard. In the ferment of struggling men, there came a fragment of hope and strength. <clears throat> These four ch uh, chaplains, they calmly led men to lifeboats, distributed life jackets, and coaxed men frozen in fear over the side of the ship. In the midst of men crying, pleading, praying, swearing, and dying. These four breached courage. I'm sorry, I cry every time I do this story. <laughs> Um, because it's so hopeful. And when all the life jackets were gone, each took his off and gave it to a soldier. As the deck on the ship started to sink, the four chaplains with arms linked began to pray. Those men that could drew close. There were no more outcries, no panic, just words in Latin, Hebrew, and English addressing God and the holy. One survivor recalls, it was the finest thing I have ever seen or hoped to see this side of heaven. Well over half a century later, the legend of the four chaplains speaks something deep in our hearts. For Father Washington didn't call out for a Catholic when he handed over his life jacket, nor Rabbi Good for a Jew. They gave them to the next soldier in line and then stood shoulder to shoulder in mutual supporting faith. This is the ideal of beloved community. This is what we want in our communities and in America. This is what the four chaplains gave us. Thank you. Good morning. I too got a little, little very clamped there. <laughs> I'm Jesse Peterson. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the head of the children's department at the public library in Chippewa Falls. Um, I was asked to share some thoughts this morning about ways in which the work I do out in the world um, reflects UU values and, and my personal beliefs and supports those same values um, both in our congregation and out in the world. 
So my job involves um, directing all of the materials and services that the library provides for kids from birth up to age 18, which is a pretty wide swath. I have two coworkers in my department who help make all of that happen. Uh, one of whom, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, Jenna Gillis Turner. She uh, used to uh, provide childcare for our UU congregation. So our work together means we do story time for kids who are um, not in school yet. It means on days when school is not in session, we provide learning opportunities and um, fun stuff for kids to do while school is on break. It means that we support parents and teachers and caregivers in their work with kids and collaborate with other local entities that uh, work with kids like River Source Family Center and the Boys and Girls Club. We make opportunities for teens to connect and gather around shared interests happen. Um, and we build a collection of materials for Chippewa Falls families and beyond. Our library is part of a consortium of libraries in the Northwestern part of the state. So that includes um, the Eau Claire Public Library, Menominee, pretty much everywhere here and west of here um, is all part of the Moore Consortium. So um, all of our materials are available to people across that spectrum. So it's a broadening of the community that I can get a book that River Falls has and have it sent right to me. So there are lots of ways in which the basics of my job allow me to express my values. One thing that I focus really pretty hard on is representation in what I purchase for the library, because I want every kid to be able to see themselves. So um, I want the kid who's Native American to be able to find material that is relatable to their life. I want the family who needs holiday books about Ramadan or Sukkot to be able to find something for themselves. I want the kid who is uh, figuring out their gender identity to have access to clear and accurate information. I want to have a book for a kid whose favorite animal is the axolotl or the kid whose favorite animal is the raccoon that was in their backyard last night. Um, and the same thing holds true for programs that we present um, or displays that we put up in the library. I want everyone to both feel seen and to be able to easily see others, which sometimes is as simple as changing the pronouns in a book that I'm reading at story time um, so that there's a mix of genders represented. And sometimes it becomes an opportunity to have a discussion with a parent about representation and what it means for our community. I want the library that we are building to be a space that is far, far away from the shushing stereotype, um, from the children should be seen and not heard ideas of your. Um, I think so often kids are talked over or down to, or worse, not talked to at all. So I want to be an adult in their life who sees them and who will always listen to them, who will set aside uh, what I'm doing and get down on their level. And whenever possible, without undermining parents, 
I want to empower kids to make their own choice and be autonomous. So um, whether that's with book choice or um, deciding whether they are in the mood for a particular program, whatever that looks like. And the outcome of that is that kids trust you. They share their artwork with you. They bring you a book that they wrote and they share their curiosity, um, their mood, their pronouns, and to a certain extent, their dreams. And they trust you to be your best self for them and learn to reciprocate that kind of thing. Um, I think that trust lets us envision what our community is going to need in the future. We recently ditched a giant bulletin board um, in favor of a magnet wall play space, um, specifically with the thought that this pandemic is just rolling right along and um, that families were going to need a safe indoor play space with space. And uh, so that has been a, a great opportunity to build community and for kids to make their own play community themselves um, and learn through play. Um, I'm also pretty excited because we have a book bike coming at the end of June. So that will let us expand where the library community goes. So we'll be able to have pop-up library at the park and at um, some of the elementary schools, lots more opportunities to build, uh, build community out in the community outside of the library building. Um, I think a lot of those, uh, that work of building trust applies to the grown-ups that I help too. Uh, library work these days is less about the stuff that the library has and more about um, the people and the community. Um, it's about uh, carrying out your dignity uh, when you check stuff out by not my not actively noticing what you are checking out or commenting on it at all unless you start that conversation with me. It's about not keeping a running tab of what any one person is who checks out uh, has out at the moment above and beyond just the basics of what we need to get stuff back. And by actively listening to everyone, um, which sometimes is fun, like a treasure hunt. Somebody wants to have your help figuring out what the book that they ordered from a scholastic book order in 1987 with a blue cover and a dragon on it was. Um, sometimes it's not so much fun when you're helping somebody get resources about cancer and the cursory amount of knowledge that you glean while searching for them doesn't sound promising. And sometimes you learn far more than you necessarily want to about someone's divorce or their gastrointestinal issues or their lifetime spent collecting nodding salt and pepper shakers. The, the public in public runs the gamut. And so um, I think something that I strive for, and it's not necessarily a, a thing that comes easily, um, is that when people don't bring their best selves to the library, which can happen on any given day, um, you know, that I bring my best self and uh, preserve people's dignity and um, don't let the 
uh, tone of any of our interactions make anyone feel unwelcome or unaccepted. So I think whatever each day brings and whatever um, moods or questions or um, upsetness might come our way, um, it's always an opportunity to practice accepting each other where we are and um, offering and receiving grace in a way that builds community. Thank you, Jesse. I know many times libraries were some of the safest and most welcoming places that I had as a child when I needed them. So thank you for doing that work. Now is the time in our service where we share of our gifts financially. We know that financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We're so grateful for this and commit together to ensure that the funds we gather do a greater good for ourselves than they might do individually. Our 50-50 Share the Plate this month is the Unitarian Universal Service Committee, which advances human rights in um, international community of grassroots partners and advocates. You can designate when you make your donation, whether it is for the 50-50 or for a pledge donation or a different fund. And you'll find those directions in the chat. And you can always text to give. I still think of those music programs where you're like, text your choice, but we, we have text to give at 84321. And uh, we will also have more music from Rob Kutta, our talented uh, violin and wonderful member. Thank you, Rob. With gratitude for the abundance in our lives, we give to help people in need and to help support the work of this congregation. The offering will now be given and so very gratefully received.
Thank you so much, Rob, for providing that music. If you'll join me with the words as we give thanks for our offering. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Bill, you can go morning. ahead. Okay. Good morning. I was making sure I was unmuted to get to all these different prompts. Anyway, speaking to you this morning, my name is Phil Swanhorst. I go by he or him. And for me, because of my past, I've spoke on the small groups without a microphone, walk around. I spoke in front of podiums or the pulpit. And I'm speaking now to a computer and looking at myself. Wow. Speaking to organizations, the individuals, and trying to get your message across because of the variety of ways we do speak to people, you have to be adaptable. And adaptable is what I want to talk about what I've done when I was involved with Eau Claire Transit as one of their city bus drivers for a little over 15 years. Retired a couple of years ago from that. I started driving bus in 2001 for Blair Transit. Now I gotta put a pitch in to our Minneapolis bus driver. I actually moved to Minneapolis from South Dakota in the mid seventies and I rode the bus there from downtown to Fridley. I worked at FMC NOD up there at different companies in Fridley and all the way up to Anoka. And it was great. I loved the bus driver. They got to know you. I rode them for a couple of years, rode this couple of different routes. I rode it to Southdale. So that was about my only experience to public transportation. Did I like big rigs? Eh, it kind of come to me because that was a thing to do. So I started driving trucks, semis, for rail transportation out of Marshfield. And I drove tour bus. And I ended up driving city bus. And it was interesting because there's a lot of different ways. You really have to be adaptable dealing with the public every day, in day, every day. So I decided I got to get involved in stuff, to learn how to do my job good. And to do that, I got involved with the union, ATU, Amalgamated Transit Union, is our union for the city bus drivers here in Eau Claire. And through that, I became involved with the state conference board. Then I became involved with the Midwest Conference Board, which is about a dozen states here in the country. Then I got involved with our national ATU. I was one representing one of over 250 locals, coast to coast, border to border. And actually we have local ATUs in Canada. And my involvement with national, regional, state and local has always been to learn what do I need to do to be good at it and to share what needs to be done that we provide the best transit opportunities in our community. I've been to national conventions in the last dozen years from San Diego to Toronto to Vegas. Now that I'm retired, I can't go as a delegate, but they've invited me to attend as a sergeant at arms. But I got to make sure the delegates behave. But after I retired, there's other ways to continue to promote and involve myself in the transit community. And one of them is locally here, a friend from Jonah, John Stedman, who has since passed away, and I started what was called CVTA, the Chippewa Valley Transit Alliance. One of our first members was Mark Flom. I'm sure an individual you know from this congregation. He got elected president and he is still the president of CVTA. From a local lab, I went on to represent ATU in our state on CMRT. I'm not trying to confuse you, I just want you to know there's a lot of opportunities to learn about trans. CMRT is the Coalition for More Responsible Transportation. And not only buses, but bicycles, walking paths, rail 
other ways than just getting one or two people in a car and going where you need to get the people. Then there's regional reamp. I've joined LNS, Labor Network for Sustainability. That's a national organization. But probably what's most enjoyable now is I'm a member appointed by the Eau Claire Transit Council, uh, or the Eau Claire Council, excuse me. They don't all ride the bus. Several of them do. One of them that rides it consistently is Jeremy Greger, which I'm sure many of you know. Anyway, they appointed me about a year ago to this transit commission, one of seven members. And I'm proud to serve as the first former bus driver, first former union member on the Eau Claire Transit Commission. And we're looking at a lot of different things to make improvement. It's really a great place to try to see how we can help improve transit in our community. So anyway, I started driving bus. What do we do as a bus driver? Well, I never realized, and now I understand the importance of learning about how to be adaptable as a bus driver. Some of our main customers are CDC individuals, you've probably heard of that, Career Development Center, and our REACH customers. REACH is regional, enterprises for adults and children. These are two organizations that help our disadvantaged either mentally, physically, or in some other mes meth method of disadvantage, but they want to place them into our communities. And a lot of them are in group homes. And that's what we do. We get them from their group homes in the morning take them downtown to the transfer center, and then they go to a central location. Right now, CDC goes, there's a place in Banbury that they go and spend their day working. The REACH individuals basically do the same thing and they go to a facility on West Claremont. And it's just amazing. These folks are some of our best passengers. And you know what? I am so happy that we get to do this as a transit system and that there are individuals that host them in group homes. Because I lived up by Chippewa Falls for almost up to 30 years ago now, close to the Northern Center. And some of these folks come out of the Northern Center and that was not the place they needed to be. We need to help people that want to become independent, get back into our community, not put them away in some permanent residence. So it is a real good thing to do this as a transit system. And I felt good. They were some of our best passengers. They always showed the pass. They always knew what bus they had to get on. And they always asked the same question day after day. If I get on this bus, will it go up the Main Street Hill? Yes. And after a week, yes. After a month, yes. I was disappointed if they didn't ask that question. They are the most wonderful people I ever had to deal with as customers. We also deal the transit system. A lot of people use it temporarily. Their car is up. They got it in an accident. It's getting repaired, getting redone. So they got to use transit a while. Sometimes a family can't afford, that has two jobs, they can't afford two vehicles anymore. So one of them uses transit to get to their, where they gotta go, be it school, be it a hospital for a mental appointment, dental appointment, or physical appointment, be it wherever to their jobs. A lot of people will use transit because it is for our climate, it is environmentally sound for 40 people to go in one bus than 40 people to drive 40 cars. Another reason it might be that you enjoy the convenience of a bus. To go to the mall, you get dropped off close to the door. You don't have to worry about where you park and or where you did park when you come out of the mall. So it's a lot of that. I personally still use the bus to go to the university. 
They drop you off right at the front door, basically, on the lower campus. And I don't have to worry about if I'm parking in the right lot, if I need a pass to be here. And I certainly don't want to try to find a place on the public streets around the university. So it's a good opportunity to use public transit in our community. Now, how do you do this? How did I get involved? How did I learn? Like I say, I, through different organizations, through different individuals, mostly other bus drivers who taught me, this is how you should take care of these kids from North High. This is what we do with the long middle school children. So there were different ways that we dealt with different customers. But I wanna wrap up with the most happy service I provide now is that I'm what's referred to by Western Dairyland as a bus ambassador. I'm a retired individual. I do it totally voluntarily. I had two opportunities just this past week to meet with Kurt, the individual that has, is a salaried person at Western Dairyland in charge of their bus ambassador program. And I will go out, I will meet someone in Shawtown or wherever, join them at the bus stop, take them with, ride with them to the transfer center, transfer to the bus they need to get to, say to go to the mall, to work at a shoe store. I did that with a high school fella that was just nervous as the Dickens to get on a, a, a public bus. And then I will go back to the transfer center and go back to their bus stop at their residence, wherever they live, go to Shawtown, be in the experience. But there's many, many reasons individuals need a transit system and many reasons that they use a transit system. I've hit on a few of them in the short presentation I've given you, and I am no means an expert on how we need to improve a transit system, but we can certainly never discard it. We should maintain what we have and by all means attempt try to develop improvements, which we will and continue to do in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about the Eau Claire Transit System. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. That was incredible. Um, our reading is Community Mean Strength by Starhawk. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned we can only catch glimpses of from time to time, community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having to watch to catch our words in our throats. Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us, eyes will light up as we enter, voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength. That joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter, a circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. I'll be filling in for Erica today, uh, reflecting on my experience for community ministry. I was talking with an old friend the other day over kolaches and coffee, and I mentioned the service, how grateful I feel to on occasion read during these services. She asked what church I attended again, and I said what I usually find myself saying, the you, you, you know, the church that loves everyone. If there's one thing I think embodies Unitarian Universalists more than anything else, to me, it's love. And the ways in which we interact with our communities as Unitarians, well, that feels like a lot about love too. I've seen this quote circulate a few times by Jamie Anderson. Grief is really just love. It's all the love you want to give but cannot, all the unspent love that gathers in the corners of your eyes, the lump in your throat, the hollow part of your chest. Grief is just love with no place to go. If you know me outside of my role of occasional worship associate, then you probably know I have a daughter who was born sleeping a few years ago. Her little life was a big loss for my family. And I find now looking back how apt Anderson's quote is about grief. Because for my husband and me, <clears throat> since our love and attention could not go to our Adeline, we found someplace else for it to go. We started doing 
sort of secret do good activities around our community on the 11th of every month, uh, the anniversary of when she was born. I'll be honest, it was partially selfish at first. It was a way to spread a little joy in a time that was really painful, but be it became something really meaningful to us, a way to spread a little Addy love in our community we love so much. We've done little things mostly, donated cat beds and dog toys to local shelters, cleaned rabbit cages, purchased formula for women's shelters, served foods at our local community kitchens. I made the not so anonymous choice of buying food for cars behind us at Culver's once, forgetting that we all pull up together <laughs> to wait for our food. Um, but as embarrassed as I was to get caught in the act of giving, I met some really lovely humans in the Culver's parking lot. When Julie asked me to reflect on the services message, I thought about how grateful I am for a congregation that seeks justice, compassion, and peace. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting emotional. Um, how we support one another in big and small ways. I thought of the food trains I've been a part of at this congregation, both as participant and on the receiving end when we had our rainbow daughter. I thought of the company I work for, Jamf, which gives us paid days every year to volunteer, which is super cool. And mostly I thought of Addie. I suppose she, like this congregation, has become synonymous with love. <clears throat> and when I think of our community ministry and what it means to me, it means healing and connection. It means gratitude and love. And hopefully you're not sick of hearing my voice because I have another reading for you. <laughs> um, Comfort Ye My People by Barbara Road. I wasn't flattered when one of my daughters confided that she had thought of me as the big there there when she was three years old. If I remember correctly, I was in the middle of a phase where I was hoping to reassure myself that I still had a fertile mind as well as a welcoming bosom. Now, years later, I can admit that the role of big there there is a necessary part of parenthood, not to be disparaged. At times, even the most mature of us want someone to dry our eyes encircle us with welcoming arms and offer us a cup of hot cocoa. I shall be forever grateful to my friend Ruth who interrupted her political campaign to ride to the hospital, make her way past the folks in intensive care with convincing stories that I was her little sister and reach bravely through the thicket of IVs, heart monitors and breathing tubes to embrace me. Still the origin of the word comfort means to make strong. As comforters, we often believe we have to take away the pain only to discover that we are only able to help those in pain find the sources of their own strength. At times it is our mere presence. I am here, I see you suffering, I care for you. At times it is a helping hand, I'll vacuum, I'll wash up these dishes, I'll drive you. At times it is a few words that put things in perspective. Never quite sure what will truly comfort another or what special act will comfort us. We go looking for big there, there and find instead the excitement of a new idea lifts us from despair. I expected little solace from a frail 90 year old father when he came, when he called me in the hospital to see how I was. But when he called me punky for the first time in 54 years, I felt the fidelity of that relationship. My narrow room was filled with memory and hope. Perhaps those of us who would be comforters could learn from the medieval scholastic who wrote so long ago, work therefore in what you do from love and not from fear. It can put aside our fear that we might say or do something to add inadvertently to the suffering of those we would comfort. If we can put aside our fear for our own loss or the pain of our own pity, then love might find a way of bringing strength to the weak and light to those in the shadows. Thank you. If you would like to join me as we extinguish the chalice. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our closing words. Um, I, I want to say thank you so much for joining us in Zoom, sorry, and on Facebook today. Uh, the people in Zoom are welcome to stay for sharing of joys and concerns, and then also the Zoom coffee hour. And our closing words come from Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we do not leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other, our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, be loving. <laughs>